Hello everyone, my name is Alberto Madonna, I am a software engineer at CSCS and today I'm going to talk about Saurus, a container engine capable of deploying highly scalable containers on HPC systems starting from Docker images. I'm going to start by giving a quick overview uh, about Saurus, then highlight some of the HPC specific, specific features implemented by the engine and then I'm going to delve into a little bit more detail about OCI hooks, why they are so interesting in HPC and what advantages they bring. Um, I'm going to present some results from performance tests of real-world applications on a production system and then I'm going to wrap up the talk with uh, some concluding remarks. CSCS has been working on containers since 2015 when, uh, when it started with an early evaluation prototype for GPU access within Docker. In 2016 we worked on Shifter, the first HPC focused container runtime and we implemented uh, some new features like native support for GPUs and MPI and in 2017 we offered a shifter based service in production on our systems. 2018 saw us work on an internal version of shifter called shifter NG which brought some improvements bo both uh, under the hood and to the user interface and we also brought this into production in 2018. During 2019 we developed Saurus and, uh, and it debuted into production last November on our flagship system Pitsdined. But what is Saurus in, in a nutshell? Saurus is a container engine designed for the requirements of HPC like multi-tenant systems with several concurrent users and the integration with parallel file systems. It proposes a user experience similar to Docker, so users don't have to learn a new tool from scratch. It is able to create containers which achieve native performance in a way that is transparent to users through the extensions provided by OCI hooks. Saros has a modular design based on open standards, so third-party upstream components can be used on HPC systems as well, and these components may, may very well come from other realms of computing, such as cloud or enterprise computing. This modular architecture of Saros also allows to easily accommodate new extensions from community peers and vendors. The typical workflow we see for containers at CSCS starts with a user creating a Docker image on a laptop or a personal workstation. This image is then uploaded or pushed to a remote cloud registry such as Docker Hub. Subsequently the image is downloaded or pulled into the HPC Center storage and finally deployed at scale on a computing system. Within this process, Cyrus can perform steps 3 and 4. When having to import images on the system, Cyrus can pull Docker images from remote registries like Docker Hub, downloading multiple layers simultaneously, or alternatively acquire the image layers from a tar file saved by Docker. Once all the layers are available, they are extracted and squashed into a single file. This operation is done for performance reason when mounting images from parallel file systems, and I'll be returning on this feature in, in a little while. From the diagram to the right, we see that these transactions are performed through the image manager component of Sarus. Now, let's zoom out a bit from this diagram and have a look at the bigger picture. From this overview of the architecture we can see that on one side Cyrus communicates with users, registries and parallel file systems, while on the other side 
it delegates the actual creation of the container process to a low-level runtime program. This interaction with the runtime is not something custom or specific to Saurus, but follows the industry standards defined by the Open Containers Initiative, or OCI. This way, an upstream third-party runtime adopting the same standards can be used to deal with the nitty-gritty parts of spawning a container while Cyrus takes care of the HPC-specific aspects. Cyrus currently uses RunC as a runtime, a reference implementation which is also at the heart of Docker. More specifically, when tasked with the execution of a container, Cyrus's main responsibility is to assemble a bundle, composed by a directory housing the container's root file system, or rootfs, and a JSON configuration file, which defines the details about how the container should be created. The bundle is then handed over to the OCI runtime, which in turn generates the container, one of Cyrus's key design points is the capability to configure external program, programs which are called by the runtime to perform additional actions on the container. Because these programs use an interface once again defined by the Open Containers Initiative, they are generally called OCI hooks. Later we will have a part of this presentation dedicated to OCI hooks, but for now I would like to illustrate in more detail the creation of the bundle components. Those will be the rootfs and the config.json. Bundle creation starts on a dedicated directory. Cyrus first performs an unshare operation to enter a new mount namespace so that no container-related artifact is visible from the rest of the host system. system. A temporary in-memory file system is then created to host the rootfs directory and the config.json. An in-memory file system ensures the cleanup of the bundle after the container exit, and also suits the nature of diskless nodes, which are frequent in HPC systems. The container's root file system is made using an overlay FS or overlay file system. An overlay file system is presented to the user as a single entity, but in reality it is a union of different layers. The lower layers are read only, while only the upper layer is writable. The image is mounted on the lower layer so, while the user is free to create files and folders by working in the upper layer, the image itself remains immutable. I mentioned previously that during the pull process, the image is flattened into a single SquashFS file. When mounting this Squash, SquashFS image, a technique called loop mounting is employed. Loop mounting allows to access the contents of a file as if they were on a block device, such as a hard drive. This means that even when reading different files in the image from multiple containers, in reality, the same single file is being accessed repeatedly, in this case, the SquashFS file. This prevents metadata thrashing and noticeable performance degradation when random accessing many small files on parallel file systems. Other locations from the host can be bind mounted on the upper layer at the request of the users or system administrators, completing the container's file system. Coming to the config JSON creation, here's a list of the most important settings. The container process is assigned the same user and group identity of the host user who launched the container. This is done to keep a consistent permissions when accessing shared file systems. There is support for image entry points, default arguments, and starting working directory. The container environment is created by uniting the environment variables from the host and from the image. This is done to propagate host parameters set by workload manager and other important settings related to MPI ex execution. In any case, the image variables have priority to avoid breaking the containers 
uh, with regard to variables like path or LD library path. The container process has all Linux capabilities disabled and is prevented from acquiring new capabilities by setting the no new privs flag. Mount and PID namespace isolation is enabled and CPU affinity of the container is set to coincide with that of the host process. This is done in the interest of performance as some applications perform worse if the container is assigned a CPU affinity different from that set by the workload manager. Now let's have a look at some HPC features that Cyrus brings to the table. The first one is about exposing the PMI2 interface within containers. PMI2 is used by some MPI, some MPI implementations, such as those derived from MPitch, to communicate between processes. The interface is formed by specific environment variables and Unix sockets, which are accessible from file descriptors. There are several problems, however. First, PMI2 requires a common dev sham to communicate between processes on the same node. Second, when using RunC as a container runtime, RunC features a mechanism to preserve file descriptors within the container, but it only works if the file descriptors are numerically contiguous. Even then, the file descriptors are not guaranteed to keep the same values inside the container. To solve these problems, Sarus rearranges the file descriptors to create a minimal contiguous set and updates the PMI2 environment variables with the new file descriptor values. Additionally, devsham is mounted from the host instead of being cre recreated for each container. The second feature is about integration of the CUDA environment. NVIDIA provides the possibility to expose native GPUs inside containers using a program called NVIDIA Container Toolkit. This toolkit exposes GPUs based on the NVIDIA Visible Devices environment variable, which is already set in NVIDIA's official CUDA images, usually to the all value. However, some workload managers allocate GPUs by themselves. An example would be Slurm with the generic resource scheduling plugin. This means that if the, se if the settings are not aligned, a different GPU from the one which was chosen by the workload manager could be enabled in the container. Additionally, on multi-GPU systems, the GPU IDs on the host are reset when moving into the container, and this potentially prevents containerized applications from working. Cyrus instructs the NVIDIA Container Toolkit to honor the workload manager allocation and sets CUDA visible devices inside the container to the correct values, even in case of partial or shuffle GPU allocations by the workload manager. These two actions do not require any intervention from the user and represent an alternative approach compared to the command line interface for GPU support which, has, which was introduced in Docker version 19.03. I have already mentioned a few times during this presentation the OCI, the hooks, and how central they are on Cyrus's design and that they offer great advantages. So it's worth to explore these topics in more detail. The Open Container Initiative, or OCI for short, is officially defined as an open governance structure for creating open industry standards around container for formats and runtime, and it is a group formed by key players in the container industry. 
Part of the runtime specifications published by the OCI defines an interface to plug in or hook external programs at certain points in the life cycle of the container. At the bottom of this slide we see a timeline representation of the container life cycle from creation up to destruction. The blue rings exemplify three points in which hook programs can be called. As you can see they can be any kind of executable like binaries or shell scripts as it's represented here. The interesting part is that these programs can customize the container and its contents. Why is this interesting? When we deal with containers and HPC in reality we are facing a contrast. Best practices and standards tell us that container images should be as portable and self-sufficient as possible. On their part images often use commodity and off-the-shelf software. However, much of what makes HPC, well HPC itself, are custom technologies, both hardware and software. These technologies are often proprietary and sometimes even machine specific. Once an image is imported on the system, we need something to cover these last mile and bestow performance to these portable images. Hooks enable us to do just that by customizing the container while it's being created, injecting, for example, interconnect aware MPIs, device files, and drivers, which are obviously tied to the hardware and cannot be part of the image. So the image remains portable, but the container is performing as a native process. From a system administrator perspective, hooks are attractive because they add another level of modularity and control to installation of container runtimes. Hooks can be selectively installed to expose contain to containers only the specific features of which are available or desired from each system. For users, this also this means that the very same image can be deployed throughout the different systems used as an application or research develops from an early prototype on a laptop with docker for example to an evaluation or on a small cluster where we might have an infiniband network up to full production runs on a supercomputer in this illustration a cray system with gpus takes advantage takes advantage of two hooks to enhance containers with machine-specific libraries and drivers. From a software development point of view, hooks are interesting because they enable separation of concerns. On one hand, developers of container engines and container runtimes do not have to integrate or reverse engineer support for complex technologies. On the other hand, technology specialists can apply their expertise without knowing the details about container creation. The point of contact between these two groups is the standard interface defined by the OCI, which is a common ground with broad adoption. In turn, this means that support for custom technologies in, within containers can be made available sooner at a lower development overhead and followed by the respective experts. This is a list of the OCI hooks currently used at CSCS in a production scenario. We have the NVIDIA Container Toolkit for GPU support, an MPI hook uh, which is MPitch based to give native performance from host based MPitch libraries, a glibc hook to ensure that injected host resources keep working also with images based on some older Linux distributions. We have an SSH hook for setting up connections inside containers, a Slurm synchronization hook 
and a timestamp hook for profiling purposes. Of these, the two most interesting uh, uh, hooks are obviously the one regarding the MPI and the NVIDIA Container Toolkit. So let's have a closer look to these ones. The MPI hook is able to replace the container MPI with host libraries at runtime. Uh, and as such, container applications can achieve native interconnect performance. In order to seamlessly perform these replacements, the hook relies on the ABI compatibility proposed by the MPitch organization. This replacement happens completely transparent to the user and only requires a flag to the command line of Sarus, which as you can see in this example is minus minus MPI and is entered before the image. On the bottom of the slide we see uh, we see a plot of some results of an uh, all-to-all MPI latency test for different message sizes and we can see that the performance profile of the container in red and native test in blue is pretty close and very consistent throughout, throughout nodes. The second hook I'm going to focus on is the NVIDIA Container Toolkit, which is an open source software provided by NVIDIA and is capable of importing the NVIDIA driver and the GPU devices within the container. As such, uh, container applications can achieve native performance without any input required from the user. This is also the first example of a vendor hook to be successfully integrated and tested on a system like Pitsdynt. And we can see a, a table summarizing some results for a quick software development kit sample in where a container and a native program achieve, be, uh, achieve almost the same uh, flops. Now let's see a quick demo of Sarus leveraging these hooks on a production system. So here we are on Pitsdynt the Cray XC40 XC50 flagship system at CSCS. I have already obtained an allocation. As you can see, we have two nodes for an ac some time. I want to show you two examples with Sarus. And the first one is an MPI example. We, uh, I'm going to use an image produced with this Docker file. As you can see, we start from Ubuntu 18.04, we install MPitch version 3.14, and then the OZU micro benchmarks 5.3.2. The OZU micro benchmarks uh, are a collection of small programs to give performance indications about MPI, network, and communication between processes. Let's load Sarus. Uh, I have already pulled the image on, on the system. And you can see it here. This is the, the image with the full identifier being ethcscs slash ozu dash mb with the tag 5.3.2 and mpitch 314. So I'm going to execute the OZU latency benchmark and first I'm going to do that with an approach that sometimes known as the hybrid approach. So I'm going to use the MPI libraries within the container image but I'm going to launch them with the uh, MPI process manager and the MPI launcher from the host. Let's do that. I'm going to ask for two ranks. And in this case, I have to input 
a specific option to the workload manager and I'm, I'm going to explain that in a moment. Saros run, then the image name. And the executable. So why do I have to specify a minus minus MPI option to the Slurm workload manager? Well, because on this machine, on this on this specific system, the default uh, MPI process manager is set to be the Cray process manager. But in this case, we are using an image with uh, plain MPH314 uh, libraries which will not be able to communicate with a Cray uh, process manager. So what, th what this minus minus MPI equals PMI2 option does it's saying, it's saying to the workload manager hey please don't give me the Cray MPI uh, launcher give me uh, a standard PMI2 MPI launcher and process manager so that they will be able to communicate with the mpitch libraries within the container and, and the, that they're coming from the image. So let's launch the benchmark and here we see the results start trickling in. The, the program is complete. We see that we obtain a bank, uh, latency of around the six microseconds for the smallest message sizes all the way up to 800 microseconds for the largest message size. Now let's see what Sarus can do with the native MPI support provided by the MPI hook. I'm gonna use the same command but this time I'm gonna replace the option to the workload manager with the minus minus MPI option to Saurus. What's going to happen now? Now that I have passed the minus minus MPI option to Saurus, the MPI hook will get into action and inject the Cray MPI libraries within the container. Since now we have native host libraries within the container, we don't need any more the option to the workload manager to override the default Cray MPI launcher because now the Cray MPI launcher and the, the Cray MPI libraries within the container will be able to communicate naturally. Let's launch the program And as we can see, the performance is noticeably better. We start from one microsecond on the smaller message sizes and up to 430 microsecond latency for the biggest message size on, on this benchmark. Uh, and this here is pretty much the expected native performance from the Cray Arias interconnect on this, on this machine. The second example I'm going to show you is a GPU acceleration example leveraging CUDA. We're going to use a Docker image created with the following Docker file. And it, it, as you can see, it is based off the official NVIDIA provided image for CUDA 10 and using the development version. We install the CUDA samples through the package manager and then call make to build some of the SDK samples. The sample program that I'm using is called nBody and it's a small simulation representing gravitational interactions between a group of bodies. I already pulled the image in, in the system And here it is. It's called ETHCSCS slash CUDA samples with the tag 10.0. 
and let's execute the program. We call it S run. This time we execute only one process on one node. Cyrus run and the image. Then we have to enter the location of the, execu uh, the executable within the image. Simulations and body and then body again. I'm gonna request the program to run in benchmark mode in double precision and with 200,000 bodies so that we actually get a representative numbers from the very capable GPUs of Pitstein. Simulation is running and here it is, it is complete. We see that we achieved slightly above 3,000 gigaflops or, just, uh, or 3 teraflops with this simulation on the on the Tesla P100 GPU. Um, to give us uh, a comparison metric whether this performance is sufficient from a container or not, <clears throat> I have compiled a native version of this same program and I have it available in, in this directory as well. So we're now going to execute that. So again, S run from with one node and one process. Oops. And I'm going to use the same options I, I pass to the container executable. Let's run. And the native simulation achieves 3074 gigaflops. So a very very close number with the with a with the container and this completely within the variability of this simulation program notice also that in order to enable gpu acceleration within sarus we did not have to pass any specific option and everything happens seamlessly for the user coming back from the demo I'd like to present the results of some real-world application tests comparing native and containerized application on the Pitsdine system at CSCS. The first test is done with Gromax, which is a classical molecular dynamics application. The test case is the test case B from Praise's Unified European Application Benchmark Suite. We ran up to 256 nodes and you can see the container data in red and native data in uh, blue and the performance profile keeps pretty consistent all across node counts with the container even edging a little bit higher up uh, at the highest node counts. The second application is a combination of TensorFlow and Horovod performing a training of a convolutional neural network from TensorFlow's own benchmark scripts. The network is ResNet50 and the training uses synthetic ImageNet data. Uh, with this test we benchmarked up to 1024 nodes and here as well the performance profile is pretty consistent uh, between native and container versions of the applications. With even variability of the results being kept very very small. The final example uses COSMO which is a numerical weather prediction code used by several European national services for operational weather forecasts daily. Uh, the test case is a near global idealized baroclinic wave and uh, the, um, the plot presented in this slide corresponds to weak scalability test results. The two sets of lines correspond to different 
uh, number of grid points for each MPI rank. Uh, as you can see, the the lines are somewhat flat, which is what we would like to see on a good weak scalability test. And once again, container and native results uh, are matched pretty closely. Starting to wrap up the presentation, I would like to spend a few words about work th about some work that is currently in progress around Cyrus. The overlay and loop mount techniques used when creating the containers rootfs require super user privileges. For this reason, there is an ongoing evaluation of rootless alternatives for file system mounting, such as squash fuse and fuse overlay fs. Development of MPI and libfabric hooks is also underway to complement the mpitch based MPI hook which is currently available. And we are also working on some areas regarding OCI hooks which are not yet well covered by specifications, as, such as how to configure and select hooks from the container engine how to print logging messages from hooks and how to control arguments and execution of the hooks themselves. With respect to hooks configuration, Sarus is currently following the model proposed by Podman. In conclusion, Sarus is a container engine for HPC environments compliant with open standards. It provides a consistent user experience with Docker and is able to leverage native performance from custom hardware and software inside containers through the use of extension hooks. Its modular design enables the use of upstream components on HPC systems and easily welcomes new extensions and additions. Here, here is a list of links uh, to the code on GitHub, which is open sourced under a BSD3 license, the, few, the full documentation, and uh, at the bottom um, an open access article that we published last year as part of an ISC workshop. That brings us to the end of the presentation. I hope you found it interesting and thank you very much for your attention.